るのもあるんだよねそれからどう See, this is what I talked about earlier. You're gonna hit a wall. Just what do you do when you that was an inspirational speech that you were getting earlier about me. You just have to power on through. Figure out what the next step is. If the bit that you've done looks a hash, just makes more paint than go over. Start again. No, just let it sit. Add in something else around it, do the next part, and then it might make more sense to you when you go back to it or when you take a step back. Like the detail you went into right some years with the magnifying glass and all. Yeah, that was. <clears throat> like, how do you even keep a steady hand? That was not fun. I tried to, for one of my biggest pieces, a uh, little Brown James piece, I painted about a couple hundred people in the crowd, and I had a, a magnifying. Like so, people in the crowd. There might have been a, a person wearing glasses yeah. or have yeah. a camera around their neck, or yeah. So like, there was there was a couple of the uh, couple of fans with like baseball caps on or wearing like Kobe Bryant jersey, and that's cool. Yeah, yeah. my friends were like, "Why did you not paint this into the crowd?" <laughs> <laughs> that's extra. <laughs> it's the kind of thing. Once you start, you like, realize why did I start this? Just how long it'll take. And you, yeah, you question what you've done, what decision did you make to arrive at this point? Right, different car. Next thing you in here, where do we? Are uh, we yeah, clean, clean the yeah, just clean your brush and water. So you have both obviously had quite substantial points in your career. You were injured. What is? Obviously, it's a long road back, but what what's the starting point? You get home that evening from a scan, or you get home from the match that happened or the training session, and you're sitting in your room like, what's the thought process? How do you go about putting one step from the other? Can you go first, mate, or not? <laughs> Cheers, Dan. Um, I suppose my biggest was probably well, I had a number of hamstring injuries in sort of twenty. Sixteen, end of fifteen, sixteen. Just some sort of start mid from senior career. And my issue was I kept trying to rush back and making it worse. And I was overtraining and doing too much and thinking more was more. So that was tough. I actually remember just breaking down and crying one time to the physio because it had happened again. And your season's pretty much over then. You know, when you're sort of doing it again, again. So it is tough. And it's probably due to your ego and your identity and everything else, especially the college student. Um, and you put all your eggs in one basket, and your whole emphasis is on football. So it sort of taught me then, you know, I've worked with a performance coach for a while, and to sort of be like, look, you need to have other things in your life to, to look forward towards and other things to put your time and energy into because seeing myself as Colin Mater, the footballer, and not just um, the, the overall person. So then I would have had to sort of look and see what else was important in my life, my family, my friends, my, my college work, my everything else. And um, I think on that journey I realized that I need to have some sort of a backup plan because sport won't last forever and if I can put the same effort and time I was putting into sport because I would leave no stone unturned in that sense but if I can put that same effort into my education I think then I was going to do well. So that was a good start. It meant then every time I did deal with injuries and setbacks I was able to handle them a lot better because I had other things in my life that were going well. 2018, I was on a good run with Rome, and then I broke my leg in injury time against Tony Gall. And I remember <clears throat> being carried off the pitch, hobbling then into the change room, telling everyone, no, I'm fine, fine. Because that's what you do in sport, you tell everyone you're fine when you're not. But um, I got a scan, found that I had fractured the top of my tibia, right underneath the cruciate. I was really lucky I didn't do it. And 
first phone call the physio just says, look, your season's over, you're out for 12 weeks. And I broke down crying because I knew that the All-Ireland Final was four weeks away and we were a good chance of getting there. And that was tough for, for a while, for half an hour, <clears throat> an hour. And then I just said, um, don't know if we're out of course here, but I said, F it. I'm going to do whatever I can to get back. And if I fall short, I fall short, but I'll give it a rattle. So I did. Didn't spoke to a consultant, he didn't advise it, but went with it. Um, long story short, I got myself back playing and started that all in final four weeks later. He gave me knee problems for nine months after and had to get an operation then, but still wouldn't change it. And I think in sport there's a big difference in pain and injury. And there's a whole thing that goes with it, the whole the ethic, ethical considerations. In high performance sport, as Stephen will know more than I will, you're always playing through some sort of pain or niggle. Probably it happens a lot in rugby. You're never 100% fit or fine. Even going into games this year where you played really well, you've still some sort of a niggle or a knock. Um, and that's pain and that's part of sport. But it's sort of knowing your body to the extent of this is going to lead to injury and that's when you need to be strong enough in your own self and comfortable enough in your own skin to say no, not today, um, depending on obviously the time of year. But then it also comes into the managers and to say, look, your, your life and um, your work and everything else is as important here. You need to be careful and it comes into physios and everything else. So. Bit of a long winded answer there, but. Thanks for that short answer there. <laughs> now you're up. <laughs> but everything's been seems bigger at the time, doesn't it? Um, obviously, it is a big deal. The All Ireland and sort of the final stages of the championship, it is a big deal. But it's not a big deal when you step back out of the football, you know, world. When you take the other out of it and you look at you've got. So many different parts of your life, your family, your job, your your own kind of keeping yourself right mentally. Football just is one outlet. Yeah. So I think when you tie everything into it, like you had said, and you just start football only, you're just calling it football. It's hard to find any balance. There is no balance, like it's just all intense. Yeah. It's slightly different between Connor myself because like my sport was paying the bills yeah. and like you know I left school at 16 then went to tech for a couple of years but like was earning a hundred grand by the time I was 21 like and by the way you can get all this more information in my book at easons.com forward slash ferris like if you, if you want to read any more I'm only joking, it's, it's, it's actually sold out. <laughs> uh, uh, like, but, but honestly, like, and, and I was very honest in, in speaking to younger lads even now, coming through, um, that I'm not saying it was easy for me, but because I had a, a talent at that time to play rugby, it, it was easy enough to kind of jump up the ladder and, and earn more money and then, and then Get more success and continue that on but what happens when you're faced with a, a huge problem like and when everything's not going well and like i was faced with loads of problems specifically through injury the whole time it was never a loss of form yeah. or um you know a, a certain coach maybe not liking my style of play it was never anything to do with that it was just purely down to injury yeah so um Injured myself against a team called Irony, which is now called Zebra in the United Rugby Championship. Um, scrum got wheeled round and we'd scored a push over try. We're already winning by 40 points. And our tight head prop, I was like celebrating like this, and the scrum wheeled round and he fell into my knee. But I, I wasn't braced for it. So like I was like, yay, and then next thing 
He's 120 kgs, the hooker's 110, the loose head prop's 120 kgs, there's 350 kgs going straight into my knee. So I went over, I was like, oh no, what have I done here? So a couple of operations later, and before you know it, Rugby World Cup 2011 is, it's, it's there, like, you know, it's, it's, it's upon you and you're going, I injured myself six months ago, like, how, how am I still not fit here? And just dug deep, got it where I was pain free, like my other said, I knew it wasn't right, but I, I was pain free and then afterwards it would stiffen up and, you know, all the recovery that you, you're advised to do, you do, and I made that World Cup and played some of the best rugby of my career in that World Cup and the kind of, the advice that I always gave to myself was that I always had to come back bigger, stronger, fitter, faster. So like I, I always had that in my head, any training session I was doing. And then my last injury, I didn't come back. I came back bigger, but I didn't come back fitter, um, mentally uh, in a good place. And that's when I knew it, I, I wasn't right. Um, and my ankle was telling me that I wasn't right. And yeah, it's, it's about dealing with it, but I think it was different for me because I didn't break my leg and then the next day hung up the boots. Mm -hmm. I had 18 months from when I injured myself until I actually retired. So that, that time to speak to the union, the Irish uh, Rugby Football Union, we have our own players union. Um, we have people in place there that help us out with um, if we want to further our education or learn a different language or move to a different club and we need to get work experience here, work experience there. Um, and then it was, do you know what? It was actually, when people said to me, oh Stevie, do you want to work a game for us on Friday night for BBC Northern Ireland? I could easily have went, do you know what? My head's not in the right place. I still miss the game. I still love the game. I'm not there. But I didn't, I just went, you know what, stuff it. Go out and do it and if you enjoy it, happy days. I've done one game, done another, then BBC asked me to come on for the whole season, done a whole season. Then I just learned to open up and accept more opportunities and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, at least they give it a go. Yeah. Like, and, and that's the, the big learning curve that I've seen since I retired. And even here today, could easily just send an email back saying, look, no, I don't fancy it busy yet. But out of my comfort zone, have a bit of crack, get to catch up with people that I haven't seen in a long time, um, raise a little bit of money for charity uh, through it as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Until you give me the feedback. I think that comes through in your work. Yeah. <laughs> Until you give me the feedback. <laughs> but do you think there's enough support mechanisms? I don't know what rugby's like compared to Gaelic, but support mechanisms in place for players who do get injured. Um, to have those other things in their life. So, like kids now coming out of school, and I said, people ask me this all the time. Oh yeah, you know, rugby players they need to have something else. Half of them don't, because they can come out of school and retire at 27 years of age with a couple of million pound in the bank. Yeah. And it's so it's about having other things in your life that. Um, aren't necessarily just work. Mm -hmm. So it might be painting. Yeah. It might be playing golf regularly, catching up with friends. It might be mountain biking. It might be other things just outside of the sport. It doesn't have to be. I hate when people come up to me and go, oh, what are you doing after rugby? You're not going back to university to do a, do a degree. And I'm like, why do I need to go back to university to do a degree? Um, and yeah, I, I just say to all the young players coming out now, find something that you enjoy doing. And if that's, like Craig Gilroy, he wants to win the law, that's, that's fair enough, he wants to do that. Davey Pollock, a fellow I played with, he had to retire real, really early um, with hip injury, but um, he went and done his medicine degree, now he's a, a surgeon, like he's doing really well. That's, that's, that's brilliant, you, you love to see that, but not everybody wants to do that. Yeah. And that's, impor channel. that's important. What is things on your passion about? If you're still passionate about rugby, then commentating on it, doing different gigs like that. If you enjoy it, you probably need to see it as work sometimes. Yeah. Because you're probably going to go to the game anyway, some of those three games. As you say, if you are, there's like a balance, because if you want to make it, you do have to put everything into it. Um, it's an experience. So those, like, yes, tell our guys to 
have something else going on, but at the same time, you're putting all your most of your time and energy and attention into rugby if you really want to make it. Double H coach. Cross them now. Double H coach. Go for a pint, all <laughs> Your name has been used for day 69. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's like a hundred days of art challenge. Now I don't do weekends because I'm not seeing, but um, every day I do a painting like this. And start all them paintings were done in like a couple of hours, right. and then sell it off, and then a uh, fraction of whatever I sell goes to aware. Very good. But it's like ah, it's grand, but it's like. Waking up every morning and just sitting there. I'm doing another one. <laughs> Jesus, what am I doing? So I'm actually only on day 54 now. I'm just going to run right off the after Christmas. Are we live, shall we? Eh? Are we rolling? Yeah. I would want to use to, I'd just mind um, change the water to the bathroom. Nice. Where's your water? I can go right outside. Just over the wall. Over the wall. Some I'm just going to find out here, maybe. Find out just. Yeah. What was that before then? I was very conscious. Half speed. <laughs> Careful, considerate, sort of. Fine brush out now, so I'm business. There's a conundrum of like, what do you do when there's a big space of. Like that tarmac there? What are you thinking? Ferris wheel. <laughs> Steam Ferris wheel. Ah, uh, I'm just kind of looking at this now, going, like, filling the the gaps, like, do you know what I mean? It's like a color by numbers kind ah, of. Ah, yeah. yeah. Do you know what? It's a, like, I think it's you know when you were like, no, I'm terrible at art. I'm, is, like, I'm is, awful. Is, like, you must be pleased. Like, awful. So far. I'm delighted. <laughs> I was delighted with the cranes, and then as soon as we're kind of yeah. going, like, it's more the landscape side of things. I don't have a clue, like, how to mix it, mix it in, and like, it's all kind of block colours, where yours is very much mixed Well, it's in. like, cranes are yellow, sky is blue, the yeah. ground is just, it's a weird one. Let's go for a bit of green in here. Where's the green? If I was doing this at home, see, I would. I might paint for two or three hours, like just in one sitting, and then I, if I do just need time away, I'll just put the paintbrushes down, go for a coffee, or go get away from it. You'd be amazed coming back, it just looks completely different. It's fresh yeah. eyes, like, you know. Yeah. Are you going to paint over the hating W and then do it over it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably, yeah. I don't know. Do you mean paint over in yellow? Yeah. Well, if you go and do a bit of it, see, I just want to know from my sketch where it is, what kind of size it is. So you can paint over it mostly and then just fill it in with black at the end. Entirely up to yourself. You want the chair gets closer to your business? I think all sir have a realistic chance of winning something this year, Stephen. Uh, yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, the real realistic chance of winning the last sort of four or five years, but the kind of big game mentality always keeps letting them down. I get to plenty of quarterfinals, knockout games, <coughs> uh, but just always stumbled the final or penultimate hurdle like. Um, is that down to a mindset? I don't think it is. I just think it's down to other teams having a little bit more quality uh, in their squad. And when you know, they pick up an injury here or there, that uh, they can re replace that player with somebody who's equally as good. Yeah. Where in Ulster, you know, they lose four, four or five players that, and they're dipping into their academy and they're just not as strong. Like. Yeah, just not the same depth. No. Whereas Lancers. They're back up in their academy house, really yeah. insane. When you're doing your punditry work, is there much uh, homework? Would you be doing a lot of prep for it? I could, I'd tell everybody this. I could easily rock up to a match and not even watch the last six matches before and do my job, I could. But 
then I'd be just absolutely kidding myself. Yeah. Um, so my wife would tell you I watch <laughs> far too much rugby, far too much rugby um, for her liking and probably for mine. But yeah, now that I'm, I'm contracted to Premier Sports, we do like a, a midweek show for um, online talking about every game. So like I have to watch Dragons versus Cardiff rugby at the weekend. Yeah. Like I'm not that interested in in it to be, to be honest, but for me to do my job right, I have to have to watch it. Who's been the best team you watched this year so far? Um, the All Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> Ireland, Ireland are playing them on the 13th. Where's Adam? 1.15 p.m. kickoff live on RT, you'll be able to catch me. <laughs> uh, yeah, at the Viva. So, I'm working RT for Japan and New Zealand and then Channel 4 for Argentina, who's the following week. Tommy Bowe and myself are working on that one actually. I enjoyed, crack. enjoyed your knockdown in Argentina, New Zealand. Uh, and that series with South Africa and Australia. It's That's good, isn't it? Class. It's lethal. It's a different style of rugby altogether. But especially when you've seen like, what Argentina were having to do behind the scenes, uh, like in the hotel rooms, practicing line outs. And yeah, walking through everything. Yeah. It was awesome. And then you had the captain, what do you call him? Number eight. The, the captain of. Argentina. Um, Matera. Matera. And there was a thing with him speaking to the referee. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was like, about insulting his players or something. I'm Tara. Crossbow. The guy called Kramer plays in the back row for Argentina. Um, and like, he had one good game for Argentina. And like, he destroyed, I think it beat South Africa or something, and he had a man of mass performance. And then all of a sudden, off the back of that one performance, I think it was a signs like a half a million pound a year deal with Stade Francais. Jeez. And like, he's been average, like, he's he's an okay rugby player, but like, it just shows you if you perform at the right time and the right yeah. stage and the right people watching that you can get big breaks, like. Would you have nerves before a big international? Yeah, game? yeah. Oh, why? How do you do that? Um, <laughs> something. <laughs> Lads either be sick or have diarrhea. <laughs> uh, thankfully, I was more feeling sick than the other way. But yeah, nerves can do crazy things to your body. I can. Um, I've been in a change room and you're standing in a huddle and they're going, right, boys, straight off the kickoff, we're going to do this, this, and this. And we're like, right, right, oh, hold on a second, where's Donegal Callahan? And all you hear is, <laughs> in the toilets. <laughs> right, oh, there he is. Uh, but I, but like as soon as soon as the whistle goes and the ball's kicked, you just end up like match mode. Yeah. There's no nerves at all. Like, um, and the nerves for me playing for Ulster would have been uh, good nerves, where you were excited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you weren't fearful of what was going to pan out, and like if you were going to play well. Like that's some sometimes people go to work or in the sport and go, oh, what about if I don't play well today? You know, instead of like, that's totally the wrong attitude and mindset to have, where I just loved it and enjoyed it. Enjoyed making big hits and getting a roar from the crowd or whatever. It was, that's the part of the game that I loved playing. But say, like, say the week leading up to it, would you have done anything in particular to try and calm the nerves or? I uh, have a routine, don't know about you like, so like a match day routine, so you know if it kind of it works a lot of the time that you kind of stick to it, so for me it was, I'd always go out and stretch the legs, some people like to lie in bed all day and just then wake up, have a stretch and then go and play rugby where I'd like to take it off for a walk for an hour, get a good pre-match meal, rock up on time, you know, not running late so that I'm panicking when I get there and I have to get strapped and I have to do this and do that. So my uh, preparation, I suppose, was, was key for me to make sure that I performed. And it wasn't just the day of the game, it was the whole week leading into it and the gym session, making sure that you um, just didn't skip on past weights. And like a lot of people just went in and ticked the boxes and went on. Like the amount, like, the amount of players that I played with throughout my career, like 500. More? 600? I don't know, like, 
Um, every year at Ulster there was 30 new faces, so that's yeah. what it felt like. And then the international set setup was similar, ever changing. So like boys were happy to come pick up a paycheck and then disappear to another club, pick up a paycheck, disappear where that didn't sit well with me. Like. But you find that each boy, like there's different players will approach it differently. Like. Yeah. Um, even the three on with pretty much routine there, some boys are very different and do their own thing, but that's sport and you have to accept the fact that everybody is different, right? Yeah, everyone's different. Do you have any pre match superstitions or anything? Miller? Not overly. Um, wear odd socks or the, <laughs> the, the same pair of boxer shorts? Or? Um, I do wear the same pair of boxer shorts. Do you? Shorts, yeah. Aye. But the night before a game, I'd have a cold shower and a cold bath. In the morning of the game, cold shower. Just, uh, Not for the physical, ad, more for like as a reset for you and yeah. in your head? Like. More as a reset than for um, the recovery pro protocol or anything like Yeah. And then. I think in previous years it was quite rigid and over would have been overthinking a lot. Would be my biggest issue, thinking too much. So this year I really focused on relaxing. Like you're all about lads maybe lying in bed and all. I would try to spend as much time sleeping, go down and get pretty much meal or breakfast, whatever it was. Go back and try and nap for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah. Do my own stretch and spend a bit of time with myself, a bit of reading or do something and then Go have a chat with some of the lads about things not football related because you spend that much time thinking about football and your preparation and coming into the game, all the work's done, it's just like um, relax into it and I would have felt you're going to be nervous, the legs are going to be heavy and um, the more I can just enjoy it, yeah. uh, it's, it helped me a lot, I'll probably stick with that now. Again, everybody's different, like you see guys who have strange routines and whatever else, and you sort of have to accept the fact that's him being him, and there's a nice thing about that too, they're, and they're just being authentic, and that's what they do, and you respect it, like. Yeah. Do you guys room with each other, if you are having to do an overnight? We would have in the past, but not, uh, yeah. not this year. Did you enjoy year. that aspect of it? Sometimes, yeah, you get a good roommate, yeah. I've been lucky now, no complaints on any roommates. Uh, no no snores? One teammate who was could be prone to sleepwalking and stuff. So. <laughs> Name names, come on. Nah, I'm gonna keep it all low key here. And then you try and avoid Cal McShane if you're on the bus. <laughs> he's always texting his girlfriend. Or, <laughs> he, might, he might be in this room right now. Um, or he's sitting on his phone or he's chatting away. Sometimes you like to just sit quietly. You any superstitions, Ru? Uh, in terms of sport? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say superstitions, but I just have things that I would prefer to have <coughs> done or sorted. Uh, I would always wear long socks, which is kind of, there was a trend towards short socks recently, whereas Gaelic traditionally would have had long socks growing up, but I haven't really followed that trend. I, don't, I just don't like it. I like having them up over the calves. That's because you're a small calves too, that's part of it, isn't it? Well, that's part of it. Um, not really, like you said, a, a nap, like I find, a nap, be quite a good napper, like I will go most days. Yeah, the best napper I've ever seen. This man's Stevie could literally be driving the car and then pull over <laughs> and just switch off and be sleeping. And you're like, how, how, did, he, do how did he do that? One of my favourite uh, nap impressive. spots, when I, was, when I was living in Belfast, and I was heading up to Derry for training, and one of my favourite spots was, do you know where the lorries fill up, the apple green? Yeah. So I would pull in after school, after work, and uh, Nip in for fuel, get a coffee, whatever out there. Got the back of the car and um, just crank the seat back. Close the eyes for 15 minutes and that would be me. Set like the alarm sound like? Sound sleep. Yeah, and then it would go off 15 minutes later and turn the engine on and get up the road with the coffee. <laughs> that, that time it had just cooled down right That's enough for, like. for it to drink. But yeah, I've been a big napper, so I uh, sleep. I'm sort of obsessive with sleep when it's when during the season. Like yeah. I would, if I if I had a bad night's sleep or I missed out on anything. Would that mentally, if, like you'd be going, oh, I need to get half an hour here, like before. Well, that's if you I, slept badly the night before. It would, yeah, it would. It would kind of play on me, and I would. I, I'm more trying to get to the point where I wouldn't think about it, or I would, you know. Yeah. 
but uh, luckily, now that I'm working my own time and I'm painting, I still factor in time for a nap every day. Like <laughs> that's the the joy of it. Whereas when I was at school and I might have been racing home, throwing whatever bit of food I could get and then going straight to training, it it would be in my head and it would be something that would I would find annoying. I would find that I would feel even if I wasn't psychologically, I would feel like I'm, I'm maybe not at hundred. Yeah. I've actually found having a whip useful for that because like it keeps you really accountable to your sleep. And if I wasn't getting eight or nine hours during the season, and that's the nice thing to be a teacher, during the summer when it's championship <coughs> mode, you have that time to sleep. And if you weren't getting eight or nine hours, you really felt it like, but you sort of got an idea too from just tracking what was helping your sleep and what wasn't. So I knew that the cold bath, cold shower, a bit of meditating, reading, Stretching, all that stuff was helping, and then next thing you know, you're sleeping like a baby. Mm -hmm. um, but like before big games, it's always tough because you're thinking about the game, like you were thinking about who you're marking, and there's so much going on. Did you on. think about that too much sometimes? Oh, 100%. That was my biggest problem thinking about that too much until this year. Where I was just like, you know, what, like whatever happens, happens. It was so powerful because. When you have, yeah, performance indicators are important, but like keeping them broad. Um, if you were basing your game on, right, I need to keep my man on scores. He scores after five minutes. Is that, yeah. is that your job over? Like, is that game done? Or I think it's a good marker for where you are, though. Like, and it's something that I certainly did as a player was always wanted to play better than the opposite number. Yeah. So, like, even packing down on a scrum. I'd be eyeballing my opposite number, who was a metre and a half away, and I'd be like telling them how crappy he is, like, you know, saying, yeah, I can't wait to run over you as soon as I get round the corner on this next carry, and like, he's like going, yeah, mate, whatever, like, you're going to smash you, or whatever it was. Um, and of course you shake hands, and you know, you're probably friends um, after the game, but yeah, it's physically, I always like to impose myself, but mentally, I always try to get one up on me. Yeah, without a doubt, but it's like over the 70 minutes because it's hard to try and boss that the whole 70. Like there's gonna be a moment I'm sure where he catches you a good Oh wow, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you keep your goals pretty broad or it's like, I wanna win more collisions. It means if he wins one or two, you're still like, right, I'm gonna win the next two. 